Good morning, everyone. And wasn't that a great presentation on, the, on art and the impact of World War I on that? Well, we are set for another great presentation by Paul Ewing, who is a professor of history in the Visual, Performing, and Liberal Arts Division of Yavapai College. Professor, I'm sorry, Professor earned his Bachelor's of Arts in Russian Studies and a Master's of Art in European History at the University of Toledo in Ohio. For a month in the summer of 1975, he represented the International YM, YMCA as the only Russian-speaking member of a four-person delegation to the USSR. On that note, let's wa welcome Paul Ewing. Добро пожаловать на Восточном фронте. Welcome to the Eastern Front. My name is Paul Ewing. I'll be talking about All Quiet on the Eastern Front, the untold history of Russia in World War I. But before I start in, uh, I would like to thank you all for being here. Um, I'm delighted that you're here today on a Saturday morning. Um, and I want to thank uh, Amy Stein and Deb Debbie Roberts for all the hard work they put into what is what I think is really an excellent interdisciplinary program for you on the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I. Um, and uh, finally, I'd like to thank uh, Todd Conaway and Mike Silva over in the Verde uh, ITS or computer support because uh, they made this uh, slideshow. They really, really helped me make this slideshow what it is. I couldn't have done it without them. And I appreciate the, the people over here who've helped me today as well. So with the, in, with the thank yous out of the way, let me get out my field manual. No officer should be without his field manual. Okay. Actually, there's a, uh, and I tend to ramble. Um, Brandy said in the previous presentation that she rambled. I think I ramble far worse. I'll try, I try to keep this to an hour. Um, but, I, uh, I've added this slide to have an introductory slide for you. Uh, and it, it's a signif significant slide because these cannon here being by, used by Russians on the Eastern Front are of Civil War or Napoleonic War vintage. And yet, at the same time, you see overhead an airplane. Uh, this is the old... This is the new. Uh, the, in some Austro-Hungarian and Russian units, uh, they, they didn't think that their government was um, advanced enough to create an airplane, so they would shoot willy-nilly at any aircraft that went overhead, thinking it was the enemy, uh, even if it was, in fact, a Russian aircraft. The Russians had aircraft. They had submarines. But the soldiers, many of them peasants, uh, were unaware of this. I put this out, uh, outline up for you so that you can see where I'm going today at a glance. These are the topics I'll be covering. Um, why has the story of Russia in World War I not been told? And a question that I never formed in my own head before I started doing the research for this was, 
how was re Russia responsible for the cause of World War I? I never knew that it was. <laughs> what were the major differences between the Eastern and Western Front? And they were vast, vast differences. How, and I'll try to be brief about this year by year, 1914 through 1918, how did the war play out for Russia on the Eastern Front? Why did Russia lose? And finally, why this story, still incomplete, right down to this very day, must be told? And here's Sean McMeekin, probably the major resource I use for this presentation, writing, so sparse is the literature in the West that searching for books on Russia in World War I turns up mostly books on the Second World War. I had this experience myself in doing this presentation, even as recently as last night when I put up these, uh, the last two slides. I would uh, Google World War I, Russia, Eastern Front, and I'd get a whole bunch of stuff on World War II. So why has the Eastern Front been ignored? Uh, an important historian named Fritz Fischer in 1961 wrote a book called Germany's Aims in World War I. Uh, Fischer argued that it was Germany's expansionist designs that were the main cause of World War I. And I think probably many of us today, here today are comfortable with that. And certainly the, the people who made the peace at uh, Versailles were comfortable with it because they blamed Germany for the whole war. Fischer's thesis of an expansionist Germany dominated Western historiography or Western historical fashion right down to the present day. So why is Russia's involvement in this story not been told because the dominant paradigm has been given to us by Fisher and it's held since 1961. Now, people like, like McMeekin are beginning to challenge that thesis and with some pretty convincing evidence. Another reason why this story hasn't been told. I think there's a, quite frankly, a certain sociocentric bias in the West we, when we think of World War I, we think of the trenches. We think of Eddie Rickenbacker and the Red Baron flying over those trenches. We think of Verdun and the Somme. But how, how often do we hear the names Tannenberg or Brusilov or Shemschrill? These are all names from the Eastern Front. We don't hear them, perhaps because of our Western bias. Probably, if there was, besides the Fisher thesis and its dominance, probably the second most important reason why this story hasn't been told is because of the revolution in Russia that became, um, in November of 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution that turned Russia into a communist totalitarian state. By the way, that revolution was a direct outcome of World War I. World War I caused the Russian Revolution. Uh, it, it was the, the major factor. It broke the back of the Russian economy. It made people in Petrograd starve, and so they were more likely to listen to someone like Lenin. So, uh, but when the Soviets took over, they sealed up all the archives from World War I. And it has only been since the breakup of the Soviet Union that those archives have now been reopened. So if I was a 20-something historian who knew some Russian, I would, I would have a field day going into those archives and finding out more about this story um, than we know today, even. The next slide also illustrates the Eastern Front as the unknown war. Winston Churchill wrote a six-volume history of World War I. 
The last volume of which, when it was published in England, the last volume was called The Eastern Front. But when Scribner's published it over here in 1931 in the United States, they changed the title to, quote, The Unknown War. Could this be um, bias or maybe even cover up of a front that was there? But certain people wanted to have it remain unknown. I spoke to the fact that before reading McMeekin, I was really unaware of Russia's responsibility for World War I, but now I am very, very much conscious of it. He writes, the, 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 the stereotypical view, of course, is that, uh, and this is what I learned when I was in college and graduate school, that Serbia got into trouble with Austria-Hungary, and because Serbians are Slavic, their, their, step, uh, their, their, their grandfather, Russia, which is also Slavic, uh, came, to, uh, came into the war to protect their Slavic brothers, the Serbians. Well, McMahon punches holes through this stereotypical view of Russia's uh, reasons for going to war. To assume that Russia went to war on behalf of Serbia in 1914 is naive. Great powers do not usually mobilize armies of millions to protect the territorial integrity of minor client states. And by the way, that's still true today. And then uh, something else that was really, really new to me was the importance of the Ottoman Empire, which had been called the sick man of Europe for a long time before this. And by 1914, we could say it was the dying man of Europe. Um, McMeekin says at one point in his book that World War I should be renamed. It should be called the War of Ottoman Succession, which gives you an idea of how important he thinks Turkey, what we call Turkey today, was in terms of the cause of this war and its outcome to tell the story of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire would be like telling the story of the fall of the Soviet Union without a reference to the United States, its foreign policy, and its actions in the world. Oops. Um. Okay. Uh, here's, here's the reality of it. Russia had fought for a warm water port in the Turkish Straits in many, many previous wars. Um, they fought the British and the French in the Crimean War. Uh, Russia needed the Straits because 30% of Russia's potential trade could go through there. And if the Turks held control over passages that were only a mile across, then the guns could just blow the Russian merchant ships right out of the water. So this was a long-term goal of the Russians. And they saw in World War I an opportunity to get it. Uh, what did the Russians want from the collapse of the Ottoman Empire? This is what they wanted. The Turkish Straits, right here. Constantinople, the Bosphorus, and the Dardanelles. Of course, many of you are familiar with the, the disaster at Gallipoli where the British and French will attack over here. They wanted the Dardanelles, the Sea of Marmara, which is here, and the Bosphorus, which is in the east. What did Russia want? They wanted Turkish Armenia. What did Russia want? They wanted Persian Azerbaijan. Let's leave this slide up for a moment and talk about these, these different regions. Um, most people know that a terrible genocide against the Armenians took place uh, during World War I. I think Enver Pasha gave the go-ahead as a Turkish leader to uh, force these uh, Armenians who were Orthodox Christians 
on a forced march in such harsh conditions that they died in genocidal numbers. I was talking to one of my US History I students the other day and about this talk that I'm giving today and referring to this, I said, you know, uh, it was a trail of tears for the Armenians, um, only on a much more horrific, larger scale. Uh, let, me, let me talk for a moment about Gallipoli here. Uh, the, and by the way, the Russians had a very effective uh, diplomat in their foreign minister, Sazanov. Sazanov was, through most of the lead up to the war, uh, able to get for Russia everything he wanted. And of course, the reason for this is the French and the British were desperate for an Eastern Front to draw off uh, German and Austro-Hungarian divisions from the Western Front. And they needed Russia's help so bad that they promised Russia, well, actually, to cut to the chase. In this map here is a map of the 1916 Sykes-Picot Treaty. It was a treaty between Britain and France, acceded to by Russia. And by the 1916 Sykes-Picot Treaty, Russia got the, the, the Straits. Russia got Armenia. Russia got Persian Azerbaijan. But of course, what's going to happen is in 1917, communists will pull Russia out of the war. The Germans are going to lose. And so all of these territories that you see here will become supervised by the British and the French. When I, when I went to Google uh, the Sykes-Picot Treaty, uh, I got maps, and this, this again shows you the, the, uh, how Westerners look at the Sykes-Picot Treaty. I got maps that showed me Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Iraq. I didn't see any of this in, in looking up the Sykes-Picot Treaty um, online. Again, this is an untold story. Uh, the Russians, when, when, when the, the French and the British attacked and their, their uh, Australian and New Zealand, the Anzacs, when they attacked this, it's this disastrous place called Gallipoli here, the Russians promised their allies that they would launch a amphibious attack on the Bosphorus here to draw off Turkish divisions so that um, so many um, of their Western allies wouldn't die. They never came through on that promise. And they got away with it. Why did they get away with not following through on a basic promise? Because the, the Western powers needed them desperately in the war. At one point, um, when some Western diplomat was giving the Russian um, foreign ambassador some difficulty, he said, you know what, if you keep stalling on this, uh, I will resign. I, Sazanov, the man you're working with, I will resign, and I'll get Sergei Vite, who's a German sympathizer, to be the foreign amb ambassador of Russia. And they backed off. They didn't want him in there. They didn't want Sergei Vita. Uh, another uh, tragedy is in terms of the Armenian genocide. Uh, before I read McMeekin's book, I was unaware of the Russian role in this. The Russians supplied the um, um, Armenians, they supplied the Armenians with weapons. And they encouraged the Armenians to attack Turkey. They even sent uh, what would be uh, uh, armed infiltrators, armed Armenian infiltrators into Turkey to try to uh, fight against Turkey. And here's, here's where the promise is broken, come in again. They promised the Armenians that should they get in trouble, the Russians would come in on their side. But when that horrible genocide took place, the fact of the matter was the Russians were in so much trouble they could not 
come to the aid of the Armenians and the Armenians were slaughtered by the Turks. What I have next for you is, I think, a really interesting film clip about how the Germans provoked Turkey into joining the war. I think you'll find this very interesting. chased across the Mediterranean by the Royal Navy. Rather conveniently, they took refuge in Constantinople on the 11th of August 1914. The presence of two German cruisers riding proudly at anchor by the Golden Horn undermined the Turks' pretense of neutrality. So they shrugged and told the world they'd bought the ships. Their German crews were given fesses to wear. Their fastest antics were the talk of Constantinople. The Germans sailed up the Bosporus, halted in front of the Russian embassy. Officers and men solemnly removed their Turkish fences and put on German caps. The band played Deutschland for all. When they spent an hour or two serenading the Russian ambassador, they put on their fences and picked up anchor. Leading in the ears of the Russian diplomat the dying strains of German war songs. The Turkish fleet, led by the girl from the Breslau, steamed out of the Bosphorus. On the 29th of October, 1914, they attacked several Russian ports. Enver Pasha had the gateway to the Black Sea mined. The Germans paid over five million pounds in gold. The Germans paid over five million pounds in gold as an inducement for Turkey to join the war. The next topic I'd like to talk about is differences between the Eastern and the Western fronts. Uh, we, we all know about the, 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 the trench warfare and how concentrated huge numbers of, of men were in the West. And that was, that was due to the, the, the distance was shorter. F uh, 500 miles of Western front versus an Eastern front that is 1,000 miles long. In the West, they'll fight over hundreds of feet to gain 100 feet in trench warfare is an achievement. On the Eastern Front, it will be a front where hundreds of miles may be at stake. Uh, so we get stalemate in the West, but on the Eastern Front, we get a war of movement with vast t territories taken, lost, and taken again. It's a totally different kind of war. On the Eastern Front, the terrain is widely varied, um, some of it extremely rugged, including uh, mountains, uh, marshes, swamps, lakes. The climate uh, at times was Arctic, at times desert conditions prevailed on the Eastern Front. And tragically, because territory was taken, taken back, Taken again, we have pe entire peoples, like the Poles, being taken over and become the objects of genocide. Civilians become targets. I think, I think on a scale, on a degree that, that surpasses the Western Front now. I'm not sure that's accurate, but I think that that's the case. And Interestingly, in Russia, women played a role in combat. Women in combat, question mark? Russians have been there, done that. <laughs> uh, the, next, the next slides point to um, difficulties in terrain. 
And I'm just going to let the slides speak for themselves. Okay. The next slide I have to show for you, I need to prepare you for uh, psychologically because it is very uh, graphic and very unpleasant. Uh, and I'm going to explain uh, what the next slide is about so you can be prepared for it. In a war of movement, like the Eastern Front was, in a, in a war where the, the, the line is a thousand miles long, instead of being concentrated, men were spread out over vast distances. Uh, in most cases, there was no time to dig trenches. There were a few trenches in a few places on the Eastern Front, but the Eastern Front, a thousand miles, was so big you could not build a trench. There wasn't time, and with troops moving rapidly from here to there, there was no time to dig trenches. Um, also, another thing that contributes to the disastrous scene that you're about to see was the Russians were in terribly inferior in terms of uh, firepower, especially heavy artillery. So the Germans, even the Austro-Hungarians, had them outgunned. And so here you see a trench, quote unquote, on the Eastern Front. It's very shallow, looks like maybe two feet deep. And in terms of artillery and mortars, just an open killing field. It was a war of occupation. Here we see German troops passing through a totally destroyed settlement in Russian Poland. Um, Germans um, took Poland away from Russia in their huge advance of 1915. And controlling the Polish population as they did, they decided to exploit that population. And one of the atrocities was they forced uh, Polish men uh, into labor battalions to serve on the Western Front. Also as a harbinger, of things to come. Uh, they thought that the people, that the disease, well, disease was a, a horrible problem, typhus in particular. And so they, they tried to disinfect these men before they were sent to the Western Front. Sounds horribly um, familiar. Uh, in, um, when the Russians here we have the Poles being mistreated by the Germans. And as the Russians withdraw from Poland, they displace, which means force into refugee status, 600,000 Jews on a forced march. 200,000 of those Jews will die in another incident of genocide from the First World War. Armenian genocide, Polish genocide, Genocide against the Jews. Uh, there, is, there is one fact about the Armenian genocide I neglected to mention. And the, the Turks lost a, a battle up there in the Caucasus Mountains, which is the, the mountain range between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. It's where uh, Georgia is today. Not where Atlanta is, but Georgia, the Georgia, the, so the piece of turf there. Uh, they, the Turks had attacked the Russians in um, the Caucasus, and they drove the Russians back. But then they got caught in a horrible series of winter storms, and tens of thousands of Turkish troops, some without shoes, uh, some without uh, uh, socks, froze to death in huge numbers. And Enver Pasha, the leader of Turkey, needed a scapegoat 
He didn't want the finger pointed back at him for this disaster because he had ordered those men to their deaths in the first, first place. So he said, essentially, let's blame it on the Armenians. And that's when the Armenian genocide truly started. Here we have Russian women in combat. These uh, units were known as battalions of death. And they, they came about after the first Russian Revolution. There was a Russian Revolution in March, and there was a Russian Revolution in, 19, I'm sorry, in November of the same year. In the, in the first revolution, the Tsar abdicated, and a provisional government came in under Kerensky. And Kerensky made the mistake of continuing the war. If he had made, tried to make peace or get Russia out of the war, maybe the Bolsheviks might not have taken over. But he continued the war, and morale amongst the men by 1917 was non-existent. Morale against, uh, amongst the troops, the male troops, was non-existent. So he thought that he would put women into uniform to go into battle to shame the men into fighting. This was the idea. And I, I think it probably had more propaganda value than it had any real uh, effect because even though there were some, um, I forget, the 6,000 such women in the battalions of death, only a couple hundred saw combat. And they did, those few who did see combat, did perform well. Uh, yet they returned or any woman in one of these battalions of death suffered, surprise, surprise, horrible sexual discrimination, sexual harassment, sexual, uh, 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 what? Uh, well, they were hassled. <laughs> All right. Uh, very briefly here, and I'm looking at the, the clock trying to get this slideshow done. Here's how the war went for the Russians on the Eastern Front, real briefly. In 1914, the Russians will advance on East Prussia and lose big time. They will attack um, Austria, Hungary, uh, Galicia, and they will win big time. In 1915, as I've mentioned already, there will be this gigantic German advance that will cause the Russian army to retreat, and Russia will lose vast stretches of territory, hundreds of square miles, will be taken by the Germans in, 1916, in 1915. Then, again, this is not a war that stalled. Then the Russians, under the most brilliant general in the entire Russian army, a guy named Brusilov, will relieve pressure on Verdun, the killing field at Verdun, uh, he will relieve pressure by going on the offensive in the, the uh, Brusilov offensive of 1916, Romania at that point will join the Allies and that won't turn out well for them or for Russia. Then in 1917 you see that in the first March Revolution, Tsar Nicholas abdicates, provisional government continues the war, and as a secret weapon, the Germans send Lenin by train across Switzerland and deposit this little viral particle of Marxist-Leninist ideology in Petrograd to help start a revolution. This was an intentional move on the part of the Russian government or the German government to sabotage Russia from within by planting Lenin there. And guess what? It worked. Lenin had a three-word slogan, peace, land, and bread. And as soon as the Bolsheviks took over, they will sue for unilateral peace with the Germans and end the war for the, for the Russian people. Well, kind of, because what's going to happen is after that revolution is going to be a horrible civil war. And for two more years, Russia is going to be torn apart by a war between the whites and the reds. The whites wanted to put the monarchy back into control. Uh, the reds, of course, were the communists. A uh, little known fact to many Americans is the United States and Great Britain sent, mil sent military forces to the northernmost parts of Russia, Murmansk and Archangelsk, 
in an attempt, as Churchill said it, to strangle the communist baby in its crib. So we intervened, Great Britain and the United States intervened in Russia's civil war after they left World War I and during their own civil war. And this peace with Germany, the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, will result in Russia losing everything they had fought for and more. So here is 1914. We can see that the Russians actually start the war on the Eastern Front. Uh, Renenkov, in charge of the Russian First Army here, goes on the attack. He sends cavalry in here, and at first the Germans retreat, um, and another leader, Samsonov, uh, is moving up from the south here to uh, attack East Prussia. Big problem. These two guys absolutely hated each other. And with a, a lack of um, effective centralized control at Stavka, the, or Stavka, the Russian military headquarters, uh, these, these units that were sent out, these armies that were sent out, were pretty autonomous. So what happens is Renenkov makes some advances at the top there, but then he gets stalled. And neither army knows what the other is doing because, well, communications are very primitive. And at one point, lacking telegraph wires, Samsonov uh, put, puts out his orders by wireless in the clear so the Germans can hear what, the, what Samsonov is about to do next, which is to advance on the southern part of this front. So the Germans know that Renenkov has stopped in the north, and they know that Samsonov, with no help from 70 miles away, up here on the top arrow, the Germans know that Samsonov has no help forthcoming, and what they do is they flank both sides of the Russian army, Samsonov's army number one, or no, number two, and it's a, it's a slaughter, it's a rout. It's, it's, one, it's called the Battle of Tannenberg. It's one of the worst military disasters in, in Russian history. Um, and Samsonov felt responsible for the disaster so he, he went off into the woods and he shot himself to death. Here you see in 1915, we have stalemate here on the west. And because these defensive positions, you could have fewer men in the defensive position and still hold it, than if you were trying to go on the offense, the Germans moved eight divisions from the Western Front to the Eastern Front in this massive offensive that you can see. Look at, look at the amount of territory. And they will take all of this stuff. They'll take back what Russia had won here against Austria-Hungary in the Galician attack of the previous year. And There's a, a, a little, don't, I didn't know this fact before uh, I did the, the work for this presentation. Uh, on January 31st, 1915, uh, at a place called Bolimov, uh, the Germans used poison gas. And that's three months before the first gas was used at Yip on the Western Front. How many of us have heard of Bolimov? Uh, and uh, another uh, interesting detail is that the histories of Bolimov up to this point say the wind was blowing in the wrong direction and it was too cold for the gas to work. Not true. Russians died in that gas attack. And uh, the commanders were baffled at the condition of some of the men, which was a state somewhere near between life and death, 
but there was, uh, but the Russians managed to hold that position even though the gas had done its work. Here we see 1916 in, in the Brusilov offens offensive that I mentioned. Uh, uh, Brusilov, the most modern Russian general of all, he uh, had, well, first of all, the Russians had a serious shortage of shells, of artillery shells, and he knew that. So given that limitation, he had this brilliant idea. Why don't we make our artillery fire accurate? And Brusilov, I don't know of any other uh, Russian commander who did this, Brusilov used aircraft as spotting uh, tools to pinpoint uh, the crosshairs on the map where the artillery needed to be laid down to take out command posts, to take out German, um, let's see what we're talking about here, no, it'd be Austro-Hungarian and German art artillery to take out the, the key spots, and then he sent in shock troops. Now, shock troops uh, exploit weaknesses in a line and get behind the enemy and do great damage, sabotage, and, and cause great confusion. Uh, by the way, oh, here, here he is. And, and do you think, for the movie version, if, if, if I stand like this, I, I, can, <laughs> I, can, I can become this guy? Okay, good. Uh, I'll, I'll be contacting my agents in Hollywood real quick. Uh, so this is uh, Alexei Brusilov. And I really want to read more about this guy. Because uh, the style of warfare that he creates here will essentially become what we know in World War II as Blitzkrieg. And of course, the irony of that is the Germans will use Blitzkrieg in their attack on Poland and Russia in the early days of World War II. This map is here for a very particular purpose, a very narrow purpose. But I, again, something that I learned in, in doing this I did not know before was that the Austro-Hungarians, who had a beef to pick with Serbia, because it was a Serbian radical who killed their archduke, both Austrians and Germans attack Serbia. And I found a, a primary source by John Reed. John Reed was the uh, American who was in Russia at the time, at this time. John Reed was in Belgrade, Serbia, when uh, at the time the Austro-Hungarians were bombarding the city and smashing it to bits. So he has some nice primary source descriptive passages of the, the, the well, nice in the sense that they're um, descriptive and, and accurate, of the, the bombardment of, of uh, Belgrade. But um, seeing what they thought was the handwriting on the wall, the Bulgarians decided to join at this time the central powers, and so they too attack the Serbians in alliance and in conjunction with the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians. Essentially what happens is the Serbian army and the Serbian people are driven out of their own country. Another trail of tears, which the next slide I think illustrates rather graphically. This is the Serbian trail of tears. They had to cross the mountains that separate Serbia from Albania and Montenegro. And they had to cross them in very harsh conditions. And many, many, many died along the way. I remember a couple decades back, well, it was more than that, when Yugoslavia collapsed and Serbia went on the rampage and attacked Bosnia and was shelling Sarajevo. And I also remember, because I was in Italy at the time, that NATO ordered uh, missile strikes then on Serbia. What I'm getting at here, of course, is that the way the Eastern Front played out has in a way determined how our own times have turned out. 
When the Serbians went on their forced march, they had to cross a field called the Field of Blackbirds. And that was a place where the Turks had uh, defeated them uh, some 500 years earlier. So to cross over the Field of Blackbirds in a second disaster made it twice memorable for the Serbs. I never really, before doing this lecture, I never identified with the Serbs, but now I do. Now I can see where their anger comes from. Okay. How am I doing here? 12 o'clock. I have 15 minutes, I think. All right. This shows, this slide shows a number of things. Here you can see the line of Russia's farthest advance, this dotted line right here. This is the Eastern Front at the time of the revolution of 1917. You can see that they have been pushed way, way back, but it gets worse for the Russians. Because when the Bolsheviks take over in November of 1917, as I said, they're going to sign a unilateral peace with the Germans. Trotsky will be sent to deal with the Germans on this treaty. And it'll be called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And in 1918, Russia will end up giving away to the Germans all of this territory, Belarus, Ukraine, and whoa, here's the Crimea. Have we heard about that recently? <laughs> the Ukraine and Crimea was given up by the communists to the Germans in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Uh, of course, the Germans are gonna lose the war, ultimately. And so, part of the story of the Russian Civil War that follows will be some efforts on the part of the Bolsheviks who will win, the communists who will win, to try to take back some of what they had lost in the Civil War that follows in Russia between the Reds and the Whites. Oh, another very important fact about the year 1917, of course, is that the Tsar, Nicholas II, abdicated. But before that, in 1915, he had made a disastrous personal decision. In 1915, Tsar Nicholas II decided on his own that he would become commander-in-chief of the Russian army. This, he had no talent at military command. Uh, he had... Uh, no ability to make this work at all, and even worse, because he now was in charge of the army, the death of every Russian soldier, the blood was on his hands now, and politically, he destroyed himself by becoming commander-in-chief of the army. Ah, I get to practice my Russian skills on you. But before I do, let me explain this Russian propaganda cartoon. And uh, this figure here is, represents Austria, and I think in particular it represents uh, Arch, uh, the Archduke of Austria. This figure here represents uh, Germany and uh, Wilhelm II. I'll read it to you in Russian, <laughs> and then I'll translate. And I'll, I'll use my pointer to help you maybe get a, the gist of it. Gladiches jes, smatrice tam, avstriets vespalziets pashvam, yevoje patron Wilhelm. Karavavi, utratil srazo vid svoj bravi, kagda vragov svojih uzrel i sam at stracha abamiel. That means, look here, look there. Austria bursts at the seams from its own weight. His Patron, bloody Wilhelm, has just lost his gallant visage when his enemies he has seen he has frozen up from fear. 
But I have a hidden agenda in showing you this cartoon, which takes me into my next point, why Russia lost the war. In this cartoon, what do we see here as weapons? Bayonets. What do we see on the spurs of Prussia? I'm sorry, on the, the, the boot of, of, the, of Wilhelm. We see spurs, horses, bayonets. This is why Russia is going to lose the war on the Eastern Front, because they had held on to an antiquated uh, notion of warfare that, as, uh, that did not measure up to the modernization that Brandy talked about in the previous talk. The Germans had modernized far beyond uh, the Russians. Um, and they thought that this was going to be a war of cavalry charges and bayonet charges. Uh, and fortresses, heavy fortresses is where the Russians decided to put their heavy guns when those guns were real desperately needed in the field. You'll see uh, poor, I've already alluded to poor communication and transportation uh, over rugged terrain frequently. Uh, shortage of supplies. There was a, a chronic shortage, I think until 1916, a chronic shortage of bullets and, and guns. Some um, soldiers were even told to go into battle. I think it was in 1915 during the great German advance. They were told to go into battle without guns and to pick up the gun of the dead soldier in front of them and use that one. And the vodka problem. It's not what you think it is. Failure to understand modern warfare. Here you have, um, well, uh, you need to know that Russia was defeated by Japan in the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War. The Japanese had actually modernized uh, beyond the point that the Russians had. And so Russia thought that in taking on these quote-unquote inferior Asians that it was going to be uh, just easy. Well, the, J the Japanese fleet sent the Russian fleet to the bottom uh, of the straits there uh, near Vladivostok, if I'm not mistaken. But here's what Alexei Nikolaevich Kuropatkin had to say about the Russian soldier in uh, the Russo-Japanese War and why he failed. That is why the soldier failed. It was not superior Japanese firepower that defeated the Cossacks. As Prit Buttar writes in his book, Collision of Empires, The War on the Eastern Front, Kuropatkin believed that the Cossacks were, quote, unable to press home charges against the Japanese infantry because they showed too little courage, end quote. And so, to ensure that the Cossacks showed the requisite resolution in the future, he ordered their carbines or rifles to be withdrawn so that they would have to get close enough to the enemy to use their sabers. Here's a guy who's a, a little more modern, uh, but um, has some deficiencies. Look, I, I can hear you chuckling out there because I think you've already read it. Look at me, I have not read a military manual for the, tw for the last 25 years and he's bragging. And so he dismisses five instructors from the staff college uh, for the military for the vicious, preaching the vicious heresy of quote unquote fire tactics. It will be those very fire tactics that will win this war and defeat Russia. Emphasis on cavalry. During the early days of World War I on the Eastern Front, the Russians committed thousands of boxcars on trains to horses and hay and grain, clogging the railways to the front with horses and hay and grain so that the troops and the munitions and everything else was slowed down by that. And note here, again, what I alluded to at the very, very beginning, the size of these guns. These are, to me, look like the same kinds of guns, 12-pounders, that were used in the American Civil War. And those, in the first slide I showed you, was a similar gun, artillery piece. All right, 
The Russians emphasized fortresses. Instead of uh, placing their heavy guns on the field, they placed them in the forts. And it, you can see here how the Germans took advantage of this, because when, when they captured this fortress of Nova Georgisk, even I have trouble pronouncing that one, in Poland, they get some more sophisticated uh, weapons that the Russians had put here in this fortress. Well, all these fortresses were ra rather easily taken over by the Germans uh, you know, in short periods of time and proved themselves pretty useless. Pat Batar in his Collision of Empires writes, despite the daunting cost of modernizing the fortresses, estimated in 1908 at a staggering 800 million rubles, roughly double the entire army budget. How can you do that? Um, and the demands of the artillerists to position 5,000 heavy guns in these fortresses, leaving fewer than 500 guns for the rest of the army, the fortresses would still stay in existence. So these older ideas of warfare hung on. Here you see the sort of the disproportionate size of a German mortar as opposed to um, the Russians. And it's firing on a fort, and I really worked hard to pronounce this name, Schremschel. Schremschel Fort. I think it's in Hungary. Don't quote me on that. The next slide uh, is graphic and shows you the superior firepower of the German artillery. I skipped that other slide in the interest of time because this says essentially the same thing. Uh, as you know, the story of Renenkov and Samsonov in the attack on East Prussia, they hated each other. They uh, didn't communicate well. Here we have a similar situation on the Galician front um, down south. Uh, Ivanov on the left and Alexeyev on the right. Uh, each of these uh, generals wanted to be the first to receive the telegram. So what happened was telegrams were sent simultaneously to both of them arriving at approximately the same time. And then they each issued separate orders based on the same telegram. How can you conduct a war with the breakdown of communications like this? And I'm, I'm hastening towards the end here because I don't want to go more than an hour. The vodka problem, it's not what you think. I think um, there was a prohibitionist who wrote this article in October 1 of 1914 uh, because he says in this article in, that the vodka prohibition is working wonders. Oh, indolent and depraved Russians are becoming self-respecting. Uh, this whole article goes along that line. It's as if the, the Russian government to, decision to abolish vodka is, is the high moral ground, and it's going to clean up Russia just like that. You know, this is a gross oversimplification, a gross stereotype. Uh, the fact of the matter is, Russia had a state the Russian government had a state monopoly on the sale of vodka. 30% of, of the taxes that Russia got were from the sale of vodka. So at the time they, well, they first initiated this prohibition at, at the beginning, mobilization. And then they decided to prohibit vodka for the entire length of the war. Since the sale of vodka was a state monopoly, at one stroke, this cut off one third of their income. And a frustrated Duma member said, the parliament, N quote, never since the dawn of history has a country in a time of war renounced the principal source of its revenue, 
end quote. That's from Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August, a, a great book. And, and cutting to the chase here, why, why must this story be told? Why does the, the quietness of the Eastern Front need to become noisy, if I may extend the metaphor a bit? Um, well, 1917, as you know, for Russia is a key year. It's also the same year that in the name of idealistic, uh, Wilson, Wilson's idealistic 14 points, and uh, uh, making the world safe for democracy, and protecting uh, Western civilization and Western values, the United States uh, it, it gets its troops to, to go to, to, into World War I. The uh, United States enters the war. And remember back to that intervention where U.S. and British troops uh, interfered in the Russians' own civil war. To me, the way the Eastern Front ends up at the same time that the United States enters the war may be one of the, uh, what, threshold years or, or watershed years for the beginning of the Cold War. And probably most fascinating to me is that the Eastern Front foretells us of the nature of World War, the, the coming of World War II. It's not going to be like the Western Front. The second, World War II is not going to be a war of trenches and stalemate. World War II is going to be a war of even greater movement. Think about the places in the world. Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, Berlin, Stalingrad. The distances are going to be far more enormous, and the movement of human beings across the surface of the Earth is going to involve thousands of miles instead of hundreds. So World War II will also be fought in all kinds of terrain. It will be a war where we see blitzkrieg, occupation, and genocide. So I guess what I'm saying is the Eastern Front tells us in advance what World War II is going to be like. And finally, the cause of many of today's conflicts. I alluded to Serbia. I've run out of time to cover any more. Let me uh, leave you with the last quote from McMeekin, and then I'm going to leave up for you a slide that shows you the books I used for this show so you can write down the titles of the books. I, I found books that were all published since the collapse of the Soviet Union. I found stuff that was new. McMeekin writes, and this is kind of interesting, not until 2015 or so, so we are told, will the first volume of Russia's own official wartime history of the Eastern Front finally appear. And even this schedule is believed by few Russians. So the Eastern Front may remain quiet longer, certainly, than I would like to see it. Thank you. Paul will be out in the lobby or in the back to uh, take any questions that you may have. Before we wind this up, though, there's several people that I would like to recognize and thank. First of all, Amy Stein on the Verdi campus, my colleague over there, who really is the brains when it comes to the administrative aspect of all of this. So I'd like to acknowledge her. I'd also like to acknowledge our administration. Actually, Dr. Wills is here today, uh, Dr. Stuart Blacklaw, who supports us tremendously, and all of the administration for supporting the symposium. And then finally, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I know I've seen many of you here for each and every day. And just make a little notation on your calendar that November, towards the 1st of November next year, we'll be doing something else. We haven't decided what yet, so we're open to suggestions, but we will be doing another history symposium. On that note, thank you and enjoy your weekend.